Now that our circuit is all wired up, it's time to write some code. Now that we've wired up our little joystick with the four or five buttons to identify position to the GPIO header of our Raspberry Pi, let's write a script in order to access those values. Now before we do though, let's troubleshoot or at least verify that our switches are connected properly. With every Raspberry Pi operating system, or at least at the time of this recording, there is a set of routines or a library that's included called Wiring Pi. Now Wiring Pi gives us this ability to change the settings of our inputs, uh, change the or, or configure all of our GPIO inputs and outputs, and be able to look at their status and condition and so forth. Unfortunately, with the Raspberry Pi operating system, by default, you get the 2.50 version of the Raspberry Pi, or excuse me, of the Wiring Pi library. This is not new enough for the Raspberry Pi 4. This, I'm on Dopey right now, so in, and Dopey is a Raspberry Pi 3B+. So if I run the command line instruction, gpio-v, you'll see that the version that came installed with this Raspberry Pi operating system was 2.50. If you have a Raspberry Pi 4 and you find that you're, after executing the GPIO-V command, you have that you have version 2.50, you're going to need to upgrade. Upgrade by using these commands right here. wget is going to give you, allow you to download the library and then, then you can do the next command in order to do the installation, and that should bring you up to version 2.52, which is good enough for the Raspberry Pi 4. Now, how do we use this? Well, you saw me use the GPIO command. The GPIO command gives you access to the Wiring Pi library through the command line interface. So there's a couple of things that we're going to use this command for. For example, GPIO read all. Now GPIO read all is going to output this table with the current status and levels for all the different GPIO inputs on our GPIO header. Now we talked about this in part one of this series. The the, the, all the GPIO pins, while they can be set to input or output, whenever you bring up the GPIO device, or when you bring up the Raspberry Pi, they're all going to be initialized as inputs. This is to avoid damaging any electronics if you have, for example, an input that is wired to a GPIO pin of the header, and that GPIO pin is set up as an output, you've got two signals trying to drive the same pin. And if they have different levels, there's going to be damage done to the Raspberry Pi circuitry. So notice that they're all set up as inputs. Now, in part one, we also discussed this, this idea of a pull-up and a pull-down resistor. A pull-up resistor is the one that when the switch is open, you bring the input signal to a logic one. When the switch is closed, the input signal goes to a logic zero. A pull down resistor is done in the other way. So when the switch is open, you have a connection to zero volts, a logic zero. When the switch is closed, then an external resistor or an external circuit will pull it up to a logic one. Notice that our pull up and pull down resistors have been enabled in different patterns when we brought up the Raspberry Pi. If you look over here at physical pins three, five, and seven, you can see the physical pins are identified by that middle, that middle set of columns, those two columns in the middle, the ones that start out one, two, three, four, five, six, and then go all the way down to 39 and 40. Those are the physical pin numbers of the GPIO header. If you look at pins three, five, seven, and then down 27, 29, 31, and then over on the other row, we've got eight, 10, and then 24, 26, 28, those all have values of a logic one on the V columns. Those logic ones mean that those by default have been tied or the enabled uh, internal pull-up resistor is, is pulling those logic values up to a one because I don't have any switches closed on my circuit. 
all the rest of the GPIO pin input pins, they have the internal pull down resistor enabled. So that includes uh, physical pins 11 through 23 and the ones that we're concerned with, the ones that our GPI, that, that we have interfaced to our, our joystick to, pins, physical pins 32, 36, 38, and 40. Now, understand that this table also gives us the identifiers that we are going to use when it comes to our script. We are going to be using the Broadcom BCM in this table, the Broadcom identifiers for our GPIO pins. Now, we connected our joystick to pins 32, 36, 38, and 40. Those are going to correspond to Broadcom pin numbers 12, 16, 20, and 21 as identified in this table. Now, we are going to be using these GPIO instructions in order to to make sure or verify that our switch circuit is working properly. Now, the GPIO instructions give us a lot of, of, of control over the GPIO header. So we're going to start out with GPIO and understand that there are a number of ways to refer to the pins on this header. One of the ways is with the Broadcom numbers, the ones that are in those BCM columns. To do that with our command, we need to use the dash G switch. So by using dash G, we're going to be using the numbers that identify those BCM, uh, those, that BCM column. Now, I'm going to change the mode of one of these pins. Specifically, I can do things like I can change it to an input, an output. They're already set up as inputs, which is exactly how we want these to be set up with this joystick. Um, so I can change, I can do mode in, that'll set it as an input, uh, mode out, that'll set it as an output. But before I do, I have to define which pin I'm going to be doing this with. So the GPIO pin 12, that's the one that we're going to, that's the first one we're going to set. That's the one that's connected to the up switch. I'm going to set this to an input. Well, it's already set to an input, so this command is not really going to do anything. But after I do that, now I'm going to set the pull up resistor to on. Notice that all of those, all of those uh, pins are right now set to zero as an input. By enabling the pull up resistor, we're going to change that to a logic one. Now, if I do a GPIO read all, you'll see that the physical pin 32, the one that's connected to GPIO input 12, that one is now a logic one because I've enabled the pull up resistor. Let's do the same thing for the remaining three, three uh, inputs that are connected to the remaining three inputs on our joystick switch. So that includes pin 16, pin 20, pin 21. Now if I do a GPIO read all, I should see that all four of those inputs, and that we're looking at, the, at that lower right-hand corner of this table, all four of those inputs are now set to a one. Now we should be able to see what those values change to when we move our switch. So I'm going to take my switch and I'm going to push the joystick so it is going up. This means I'm closing the switch on GPIO 12. Look at that line, the one that is connected to 32, physical pin 32. If I do a read all now, notice that that pin went to a zero. If I were to release it, do another read all you should see it go back to a one. Now I'm going to push it down. So that means that the up switch is connected properly. Let's see if the down switch is connected properly. I'm going to hold the down, hold the switch, the joystick down, do another read all. Notice that physical pin 36, GPIO 16, went to a zero. I release it, it goes back to a one. Now I'm going to go left. Notice that physical pin 38, GPIO 20 went to a zero. I release it, it goes back to a one. Now I'm going to do a read all after moving to the right. Notice that GPIO physical pin 40, but GPIO pin 21 went to a zero. I release it, it should go back to a one. All right, so it looks like our circuit is working. If you didn't get that same, uh, same uh, result, then one of your pins is not quite wired correctly, or perhaps your ground is not correct, uh, correctly connected. Now let's create our script. 
Now, we're gonna just do the same process that I usually do. We're gonna make a directory for this uh, GPIO uh, script. I'm gonna go down into it. Then, as you know, I do a touch joystick.js. That touch command is going to make it so that I create this empty file so that whenever I do npm init, it'll go ahead and use that as the default entry point. So I created that empty, empty file. Now I'm gonna do an npm init dash y to take the defaults. It'll create my JSON file. And now I need to install the packages that I need to use. I only need to use one package. It's not wiring pi, it's another package, but it'll give us access to the same functionality. If you go to the npmjs.com uh, website, you will see a package, you'll actually see many packages that allow us to interface with the GPIO bus. But the one that I'm gonna use is np, we're gonna do npm init, install, and we're gonna do pi pi gpio. I know it says, Pi GPIO, but I keep wanting to pronounce this thing PigPO. Uh, not quite right, I guess. All right, now that it's done installing, let's go ahead and edit our code. So we're going to go and use just a basic editor. I'm going to just use nano. And there are a couple of things that I need to do. First, as you know, in order to access the P, the, the, uh, the, uh, PigPO uh, functionality, we have to create an object, right? And so we're gonna do a const, uh, we'll do GPIO and do a require and access PIGPIO and specifically the object GPIO, all right? And I'm gonna neglect to add comments here just in the interest of time. Uh, hopefully my, my uh, corresponding lecture will tell you exactly what it is that we're working on. Now, the next thing I need to do is I need to create objects for each of the four buttons. So I'm gonna create an up button, out, uh, up button, down button, left button, right button. I'm gonna create four objects and we have to configure those based on the constructor, uh, cons the GPIO constructor. So I'm gonna create a const and we're gonna do up button, equals new GPIO. So we're gonna use the constructor. Now the constructor takes two parameters. It takes one parameter, which is the pin, and the second parameter it takes is the settings for that particular input or that particular GPIO pin. So the first one is the pin. Now the up button is connected to GPIO 12, Broadcom numbering. And uh, so all we need to do is just simply put 12 there. The next thing we need to do is create an array of elements that identifies the properties that we wish this GPIO pin to have. The first thing that we need to do is tell it whether it's gonna be an input or an output. So I'm gonna set the mode using the GPIO constant input. All right, so I've got my mode set. that It's gonna be used as an input. Second thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna enable the pull up resistors using the parameter pull up down. Okay, now this particular array element, this identifier pull up down, is going to take a constant, one of the GPIO constants, so GPIO, and the constant is going to be PUD underscore up. Now if we wanted to use a pull down instead, it would be PUD underscore down, but basically we're going to enable the pull up resistor, just like we did with the GPIO commands at the command line. Now, the last thing that we're gonna set, the last parameter we're gonna set is going to be um, what allows us to call the interrupt routine. Remember, we talked about um, on the first part how we're gonna use an interrupt in order to trigger an event to detect that this button has been pushed. If you're interested in interrupts, we have a lesson on um, on the general you know use and and uh, and kind of configuration of interrupts. Take a look at it, and you'll get a better idea for interrupts. But in this case, just accept the fact that we are looking for an event. Now, what's going to trigger this event? Well, what's going to trigger this event is a transition from a one to a zero on the input pin. So that's a falling edge. So we are going to configure this to trigger based on the edge, GPIO, whoop, falling 
edge. All right. So that should be it to configure that. So edge GPS, there we go. All right. Now that should be the end of the you need. That should be the end for that particular constructor. But remember, we've got four buttons. So we need to configure this or do this four times. So I'm going to copy that and make four copies. All right. Now going back up. So we have the down button object. All right. And that one is going to be pin. What did we say that was pin 16? It's going to have the same parameters. And then we're going to have the left button. And that's going to be pin 20. And then we're going to have the right button. All the same parameters, just g different GPIO pins. So that's going to be pin 21. And that should be all we need to do to define the objects. And once we've defined the objects, let's just do a console log and we'll just simply output something like um, the uh, GPIO inputs configured. All right, just to let the user know what's going on. Now, at this point, all we've done is configure the inputs. We haven't actually developed or created the interrupt service routine to detect when they are pushed. That takes an event. And the event that we're looking for is for each one of these button objects, we're going to use the dot on and use the event interrupt. Now, remember, the on method requires two parameters. The first parameter is the event that you're looking for, but the second parameter is the callback function that is going to be called whenever that event occurs. This callback function, for in the case of an interrupt, is going to return the level of the pin. So, what we're going to do is we're going to create these uh, events. So, up button dot on, and we're going to have the event interrupt. All right, and then we're going to have the function, the callback function that is going to get level returned. Now re realize, we don't need to worry about the level because we have set up in the objects that it's a falling edge that's going to trigger this event. Since it's a falling edge, if we enter this, we know the level is going to be a zero, but that is the parameter that is going to get returned to us in case you want to read what value is on that pin. So we're going to finish up this is where our callback function is going to be located. And, you know, at this point, let's just simply say console.log and we're going to just write up that up occurred. OK, and that's really all that's needed for this this little routine we're creating. Uh, understand that all we're doing is just outputting to the console when a button gets pressed. We're going to make a copy of this. Uh, so we'll make a couple of copies of this. One, two, three, four. So we have all, whoops, we have all four of our buttons. So we'll do down button, and that one's going to output down when it's pressed. We have left button. That one is going to do left. And then we have right button, oops. And that one is going to output right. Now, if you know me, you know that I like for our programs to exit gracefully. Um, and that means we're going to, since we're going to stop our script using control C, I'm going to create a, an on event for the process, the built-in process object. We're going to do an on event specifically looking for sig int. And sig int is a signal that is sent to our script as it's running to say it was interrupted specifically by the control C. So let's do the callback function. It does not receive any parameters. And that should be, that should finish the syntax for the on. Um, for the on method and let's just do console.log and we'll do a carriage return to keep things nice and e nice and clean and we'll just say received sig int exiting gracefully 
Right? And then we actually have to do the exiting because that is not done for us. And we need to do call the process, exit method, and that'll exit for us. So this should be all we need to do for our script just to detect if the buttons have been pushed. Let's go ahead and save it and exit it. Now, one thing that's important to understand, we are accessing hardware, specifically configuration registers and the physical pins and so forth. This means that we need to have root privileges. We have to do this with a super user command. So to execute this script, you have to precede it with super uh, uh, sudo, and then we'll do node and then joystick.js. And we hit enter, says that our GPIO pins are configured. Now all I need to do is take my switch. Let's move it up, A, up, down, left, right. I'll be darn, it works. Now, some, oops, I press left once, but I got four detections. If you remember from part one, we talked about switch bouncing. You just saw a little bit of a switch bounce. There were four of these falling edges due to just a single button press. So let's take care of switch bouncing. In order to take care of switch bouncing, we need to, well, you remember, there were a couple of ways to do this. I'm not gonna add any capacitors to this circuit, but what we could do with software was to insert a delay. Turns out that the PI GPIO, that library, gives us the ability to add a delay. So if an interrupt occurs, it's gonna say, I am going to wait a little bit of time specified by your code. I'm gonna wait a little bit of time before I allow another interrupt to be triggered. This is with a method called the glitch filter. And so let's go ahead and hit control C, and then we're gonna go ahead and edit our code. And right after we set up our buttons, but before we tell the user that the GPIO pins have been configured, I am going to, for each one of my objects, so up button, I am going to call the method glitch filter. And I'm gonna specify the number of microseconds it needs to wait before acknowledging another glitch. I'm just gonna put 100 milliseconds or 100,000 microseconds. So we're gonna do that. Let's go ahead and copy this guy. And we will paste it, paste it, paste it. All right. Now we'll do this for down button, for left button, and for right button. Save it, exit it. And now we shouldn't have any button, any bouncing. It should be nice and clean. And there you go. All right, now the next step is we're gonna provide the user a little bit of feedback by making a beeping noise with a piezoelectric buzzer every time a switch press is detected.